It's not like Perfect. anything super structured. I really like to, you know, just pick your brain and get to know you. Um, Absolutely. You, you're like, you're the first trans lifter that we've had. And um, it, I feel really? like, it, yes. And I feel like it came um, perfect timing because I didn't hear about your episode initially. It was kind of funny. Somebody had reached out to me. They're like, oh, we would love to hear um, her on the podcast. Like, and I was like, <laughs> I have no idea who this is. And so it was right before <laughs> your episode came out. <clears throat> And I was like, okay, let me, you know, tell me a little bit about her. Like, you know, why? Because people recommend people, but sometimes it's mm -hmm. like for their own gas up, you know, like, oh, she's my client. So they want to have her on there, <laughs> which has happened mostly when men do it. I will say that. Um, but yeah, so then like, I swear, like three days later, my mom was like, oh my gosh, you need to watch this episode. It was so good. I was crying. Her I mean, you know, I'm sure you've heard it, right? Yeah, of course. And, of uh, course. And I was like, okay, I can't watch it when I normally watch it because I know I'll cry in the middle of doing my makeup. In the morning, I'll put on my stuff and then I'll, you mm -hmm. know, I'll get to it. Um, but I did. <laughs> and of course, I cried. Like, so it was, it was so funny because uh, you had later on posted, I think you tweeted about your dad saying, add a girl. And uh, it was so, like, perfect. It was, it's so impactful, right? It the was. The most impactful thing. It was. And it was, I mean, I felt it and I didn't even think about others felt it too. So mm -hmm. much that they reached out to you or made comments and, and absolutely so that you could hear, which was really awesome. But um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to get into like, how did this whole process start with you getting onto the show? Like, where did that all come yeah. from? Um, so Lori, the owner of Liberation Barbell Club, she brought me on to the Liberation team in 20, uh, late 2020 or early fall 2020, excuse me. Um, and I guess somewhere along the way that year, she kind of was like, you know, this girl kind of has a good story to her. <laughs> um, so she got together with some members from the gym, the manager of the gym, uh, Julia Hamilton, my coach, Vinny, my girlfriend, Katya. Um, and ultimately, Vinny and Katya like helped brainstorm this like big nomination story, like basically saying like who I was, what I'm doing, what my plans are for, for, for the future and, and, you know, all the work that I want to do. Um, and essentially they just sent it into the queer eye nomination. Um, and the producers just go through and pick out who they like. Um, funny story. They actually, I think a different person actually fell through, um, because they had to leave, uh, Austin for COVID the first time they tried to film. Mm. Um, so this is actually them coming back and, and filming up the rest of the, uh, the rest of the season. Um, so somebody fell through and then they went back to the drawing board and they were like, oh my God, why, why wasn't this girl? Like, why haven't we gotten this girl in the first place? Like yeah. what's going, what's going on here, y'all? Um, so, so really it's like, it, it's all just all of a sudden, like, I just got a call from Lori one day saying, Hey you might get a call from a Netflix producer in like 10 minutes here. And I was like, what did you say? Oh my God. I would have been tripping. <laughs> oh, I was mad tripping. And like, this is during like the, one of the worst parts of our year, our old apartment had sprung a sewage leak. We were basically uh -huh. homeless for a little bit. It was a really rough spot. Um, just going place to place. Um, so for life to be basically falling apart and then all of a sudden to have this one little like, Oh, by the way, yeah, you know, right. It was super huge, super huge. Um, from there, it's really just, uh, sorry. Um, from there, it's, it's really just like the producers kind of just take you on dates. Um, oh, okay. like throughout, to get throughout to know like, you. A, like a, basically, yeah, it's like okay. a two month process. The producers like take you on dates. There's one producer in particular, um, Wesley, my, a very close friend of mine now. Um, and he basically was like on my phone every week, like, Hey, wait dinner night. Hey, you want to go dinner? Hey, you want to go to lunch? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what are you doing? Um, and like to have somebody, you know, I feel like a lot of shows like you get casted and then they kind of done nothing happens until the actual show starts. Right? right. But to have somebody that's constantly checking in on you and constantly asking you questions and making you really think about your own story. Um, and then for them to be really bringing out the best parts of you and, and learning which best parts of you to put on screen. Like that's it was just such an impactful experience for me because like. The more that they learned about me, the more that I learned about myself and the more that I learned about them. Right. It was right. a very, very great experience. Right. I could see that because even just in the episodes that we see, you know, it's like a lot of the conversations you're having. Um, it, it, at least it looks like you're sort of having some realizations at the same time as well. Right. So like you're like, huh, yes. or, or, you know, you're having these moments where we could live it in with you. That makes us think, too. Um, wow, that's pretty amazing. Okay, so then this whole process, you guys, and then it just comes to be like, hey, you're going to be on the show. This is happening. It's going down. Yeah. 
So Mm -hmm. filming, they start filming what, like at the gym or do they start filming at the house? How does that all work? Um, It really just depends. So for me, they started filming with the gym first. They wanted just some good training clips to throw into the episode. Um, So most of the filming actually happens within a week span. Um, Usually you're you come in on Monday, you get surprised by the five and then they whisk you away for the week and you're gone Um, and you're just doing one thing after another film, 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 film. For me, actually, it was an interesting experience because we started um, we started on a Monday and then the next day somebody on the crew tested positive. Um, Mm. So we had to halt filming for a week. Um, We couldn't film that next week. So it was basically jumping two weeks forward. Um, So like it was very much like, okay, everything's starting. And then like, boom. Yeah. And done. Yeah, and it's momentum like, uh, a little bit, right? <laughs> yo! <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so, um, so for the week itself, they, they came in on Tuesday. I thought I was getting more training footage. Um, and I was like, cool, I got a heavy deadlift today. Like, it's going to be, it's going to be yes. a good day. We're going to get a good video. And then, um, I'm looking up like mid set. It's a, a, a set of six for like a, for heavy deadlift. And I'm like, those cameras aren't looking at me. And then it was like the realization of, oh, that's a big SUV that just pulled up in front. Oh, that's Jonathan Van Ness walking in. Oh, that's the Fab Five. Oh, this is happening right now. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Surprise. And and from there, yeah, (laughs) surprise, right? And and from there, it's just like a whirlwind of just like everybody in your face, everybody asking you questions, everybody trying to get a good moment out of you. And it was just like, you know, none of it was scripted. None of it was, was like made up. None of it was ingenuine. Everything was very clearly authentic genuine there was not a single moment in there that i felt like i really had to act yeah. it was just me being me wow that's that's amazing to hear because that's never the case right when we talk about like especially yeah. reality shows or things like that i've had so many friends who've done things and um they have to play a part or they have to kind of play up certain things and it's just very mm-hmm. uh not authentic yeah it's, that's that's refreshing to hear because then it feels better too we get to watch this whole transition and this whole thing. So I was like amazed by the whole process, just the hair, the uh, um, clothing out, you know, outside of the experience itself of like, you know, speaking and, and the emotional experience, what was like the fun, the fun, funnest parts of the whole, I guess the whole experience. Well, I mean, they really just make you a celebrity for that week. Um, They put you up in a real nice hotel. They have people pampering you the whole week. Like, they're constantly asking you, like, hey, you hungry? You want a snack? Like, you need anything? You want anything? Really? Um, But there there was a moment when I made, like, a passive comment walking past the grocery store right before a clip. um, And I was like, God, I would love some watermelon. And it was like, boom, like, in my hand, right right there immediately. (laughs) And I was like, okay, like, this is how this is how this is. Yeah. so, like, just being able to be, like, pampered and really taken care of for an entire week was something I've never experienced, yeah. right? Um, and then to have, like, five stars, you know, Netflix stars just, like, asking me questions and carting me around. It, it was just a really, really, like, new and awesome experience that, like, you know, taught me so much about myself. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. I know that I've seen you and Jonathan get kind of close. Can you tell me a little about about, mm-hmm. about that? Yeah, we really hit it off like that very first day. Jonathan walked in and it was like instant, like, oh yeah, this is this is this is my person. Yeah, um, I'm I'm their girl. Like yeah. that's that is it. Um, it was actually late August, a couple months after filming, that um, they actually had a problem with a trainer that was that had moved here for them, mm-hmm. and that trainer had to run off and um, deal with some emergency issues. And essentially, Jonathan reached out to me and was like, hey. Um, I'm doing a lot of gymnastics work for my, my comedy shows. We we do, we do a full routine before each show. Um, and I need somebody who's, yeah. And I need somebody who's going to help me out and keep me fit so I can stay like in shape for that. Um, and I was like, look, I can't coach your gymnastics, but I can coach some strength and conditioning. Right. right. And I can, I can get you lifting and we can get moving and I can really get you going. Um, so really this past, like, I'd say six months have just been repeatedly, like I'm seeing them every day. I'm wow. seeing JVN every single day. We're doing either gymnastics, we're lifting, we're 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 running, we're we're doing some cardio. Um, and really, it's about like not only managing how well JVN recovers and, and trains, but also like 
being kind of a training partner too, like yeah. being there for the gymnastics days where I'm not necessarily coaching, but I am still performing and I'm still, I'm still training too. Um, it's really important just creating that environment for them and really for everybody else that's at, that's at those sessions. Yeah. I mean, it's really fun to watch when I saw him pull that, I saw him deadlift. I was like, that's where it's at. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you got to get Absolutely. coach. <laughs> I was, I was real clear. I was like, you know, we're going to be doing a fuck ton of compound movements. Like, yes. I know that, like, we're going to do a lot of shit in gymnastics, but if we want to keep your body up with all this other movement, I want to get some external stimulus on there, and I really want to push the boundaries here. Totally. Um, and I was like, and honestly, um, shout out to Jonathan, because I, I, have a, I have a good amount of athletes, and a lot of my athletes don't push themselves as hard as Jonathan does. Yeah, um, you, Jonathan, you made a post like, about that, like that he's like mm-hmm. a really hard worker. And I mean, I could imagine he's just people who are successful like that. And you see what he does. I can imagine that translates into his training as well. Absolutely. Like as for somebody with so little time for somebody who's literally like rushing out, like love you by with every single training session. Yeah. Um, for somebody to apply themselves the way that, that Jonathan does, it's just like it was a crazy experience. I was like, OK, how dedicated are we going to be going into this right that was my question yeah. but it was day one it was like okay we know what we're doing we know how to move we know what we need to learn um and let's just get going right and it was just super refreshing and just an awesome experience yeah you got to be efficient i guess you know if you're going to be successful you got to be efficient with your time you got to be able to absolutely. get in there and get out absolutely like you know we only have an hour for these training sessions usually so it's just like get in get out boom 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 yeah that is so awesome to see. I, I just love and all that, you know, all the compound movements really do translate to overall base strength. I think people forget that, mm-hmm. you know, like there's so much Absolutely. specialization that goes on and like you want your you want people to run faster. They need to be a little stronger. That'll I mean, if that base strength is there, that'll definitely help them. And I can only imagine that would translate into gymnastics in the same way. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, like I'm a big believer that like um, strength <clears throat> sport training and training like a strength athlete should be a primary part of every single sport. Like we should be building up our, our base strength first before we should even be like throwing ourselves at the field. And we, we should be, you know, we should be squatting and deadlifting before we start doing like unilateral midair floating resistance band on one side, hand on it, you know, like, like let's squat deadlift. Let's do some cleans and snatches and then let's start doing this. If I could lift stuff, right? my mic right now and drop it, that's exactly what I would do. Cause that is, ex- I preach that all the time, but there's so much quote unquote specialization that goes on, especially at a Absolutely. young age, which is so unnecessary. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of these kids can't even stand well. Like you have them challenge in certain, you know, even just standing on one foot and transferring back and forth, that that can be difficult. But then you're going to have them do such specialization or, or very advanced things like you're talking about. And it's jokingly, mm-hmm. but it's very true. I mean, we see that all the yeah. time. Um, that's amazing. So tell me a little bit about how you got into powerlifting, because I know you were weightlifting throughout high school and mm-hmm. college, right? Uh, so I played football throughout high school. Um my uh, weightlifting training back then was limited to just, you know, what the football coaches could teach us. Right. Um, but I did have the best clean in the gym, I will say. Um, <laughs> so coming into college, I, I stopped playing football. I didn't get recruited to go anywhere. Um, so it was very much like, OK, what now? And getting to college, being alone in the dorms, it was very much like, OK, the really the only the real thing that I truly know that I'm good at is lifting. Um, so you'd see me 6 a.m. every morning. I would run, literally run from the dorm to the gym, get in, lift for an hour, run a mile, lift for another hour, go out and eat and, and just like recover and do my best to, to come back better the next day. Um, and really like that first exposure throughout that first year was just absolutely massive experience for me, like learning how to really control my body and really learning how to build my body like what parts of my body build the best like what need more volume like what what needs a little bit less volume what needs a little bit more recovery those things were all questions that I answered throughout the course of those first two years of college um and then as you said I joined the Olympic weightlifting team over at UT um in 2019 um and so I competed with them for about two years until I started my transition Um, and honestly that experience kind of just built me up for, for any kind of career in sports. Like, I think that for a while I was stuck in this idea of like, okay, once high school sports are done, if you didn't get recruited to go to college, you're done with sports. Right. Right. Like, um, and really that, that shouldn't be the case for a lot of people, you know, like we shouldn't just be giving up on sports after we turn 18, you know, like we should be playing sports well into our like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Right. Yeah. Um, 
So to come onto a team and have a coach look at me and say like, no, like we're going to be competing and you're going to be an athlete, athlete. And to have a coach that called me an athlete, yeah. that was a huge game changer. And it really changed my outlook to really the rest of the strength world. Um, as for powerlifting, I started powerlifting um, like January 1st, 2021. <laughs> nice. Um, so really, I started hormones July 2020. And I spent those six months just like setback after setback. It was mm-hmm. like every week I'd come back, I'd feel weaker. I'd feel I'd feel less athletic. I'd, I'd, I'd feel more tired. I feel like I couldn't stand up my cleans, my snatches. Like for to be somebody who was snatching like 94 a few months prior and then getting stuck under and not being able to stand 85 up and actually struggling with it, that was a completely new experience for me. Um, and really those first six months was just like, just experiencing strength drop, experiencing right. motivation drop, experiencing like my body's going through changes and they, they kind of suck. Like yeah. I'm losing all my strength. Like this is just disappearing. It's melting yeah. off of me. Um, so in January, um, my current coach, Vinny, he tested me and he was like, look, you're an athlete. You've been training weightlifting for six months and you just feel like you've been running in place. You need somewhere to compete. You need something to do like in the, in this two year time where you're going through your hormone process before you go back to Olympic weightlifting. Um, because that's the mandate is you take two years off and then come back on. Um, and so really what he said was, look, I know how you feel about this separate class that USAPL has made um, and how you feel like they're, they're basically telling you, like, you're not a fucking woman. You know, they're, they're telling you that you don't belong in these spaces. They're telling you that you, like, shouldn't be competing or even, like, lifting next to, um, like, a, a other cisgender athletes. Um, but he said, we can make some change from the inside. And we can truly show people that you're not something to be scared of, that you're not, you're not something that's going to threaten the the sanctity of sport, that you just want to exist in these spaces and that you are a fair competitor and you're working just as hard as every single one of those athletes out there. Um, if not harder. Yeah. Right. Um, and really for, for him to reach out and say like, you're an athlete and you need to compete. It was just like, boom, instant click, like, all right, let's get started. Um, I hadn't benched in years. I had a I had a full Ollie squat. I my deadlift was all screwed up. <laughs> so really, it was just like taking uh, taking those months and just like learning the technique. I figured out really early on that like no matter what everybody else says about my strength levels and my muscle mass, that I I really don't feel like a strong athlete. That a lot of my a lot of my skill when it comes to the lifts comes from my technique and comes from knowing how to be efficient and knowing how to truly utilize the best parts of my body to lift that weight up um and really perfecting technique has just been my goal for the past year it's just been like you know what i have to be perfect like this like i have to be perfect every time i'm on that platform if i'm not perfect then i'm not doing good enough i'm not working hard enough yeah um and coming at it coming at powerlifting especially with that philosophy is just so important right um what do you i feel like somebody from? honestly it comes from always kind of being the the unathletic kid growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, the first ten years of my life, I I was playing a lot of sports. But when I say playing sports, I mean sitting in the sitting on the soccer field, pulling the daisies out of the grass, right? Like, <laughs> um, you know, I didn't really become good at sports until high school when I started playing football, and the coaches actually were were telling me like, hey, you may not be as large as the other kids, you may not be um as coordinated as the other as the other kids but you're quick and you move really well like you you can you can get around somebody really well you know how to move your body you know how your body works um and we can really take advantage of that yeah um so during football it was i was drilling it was every day other 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 athletes would be smack like smacking each other on on the field they'd be just be running at each other all day long but for me it was like footwork drilling i'm gonna get past you you're not gonna even touch me right? right Um, and making technique a priority from the very beginning was always a key goal of mine. Um, and to bring that into strength sports was even better. Yeah. I think that people miss out on that a lot. Right. So I, I hear this story a lot and I I feel like I can relate to this where I'm not the biggest, I'm not always the strongest. Um, but the thing I can control is how well I move and how well Mm -hmm. I move that bar. And if I can focus on that, then yeah, I got to leverage up. And if I can really hone in on my technique and perfect it over the years, then I'll be stronger 
um, and not just meat headed around, you know, like, yeah, like some of us absolutely. do. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right. Um, I'm always saying like, like the hormones don't make the athlete, the, the, the body doesn't make the athlete. It's the skill and the talent of the athlete that makes the athlete. Right. Yeah. Um, the top level lifters, like for some reason, in powerlifting, people want to say it's, it's only a strength game and it's it's only just how strong you are and that's it. And I'm like, I refuse to accept that. Yeah. Like, this is a this is a technique sport. Like, this is perfecting how we move over and over and over again until you can't like you can't fuck it up. You know, like we are trying to reach <laughs> utter perfection, perfection on the platform. That is the goal. That is the ultimate goal. And to say that this is simply just a sport all about strength. Like you're taken away from all this hard work that so many athletes have been doing for years, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. So you were talking about how like when you first started transitioning and, and using hormones, that the strength and everything went down. What do you think was some of the biggest struggles during that time? Because it's, it's interesting to have somebody who is, I mean, I, I, you know, we don't hear often of people who are transitioning and then still trying to be strong, right? Where testosterone or a higher level of testosterone would be in a benefit. So like, to me, that, that's, that would feel like such a struggle for me mentally. And it sounds like it was for you. How was it? Honestly, the only thing that saved any kind of strength sports career I had was switching sports. Mm -hmm. Um, if I had continued to train Olympic weightlifting for the past year, I probably wouldn't be in the gym anymore. Not because I don't love the sport, but because it literally felt like I was running in place and training for a like a goal that wasn't anywhere in my sights, right? Yeah. Like this competition, whatever future competition was out there, whatever future path was out there was two years away. Yeah. Um, and so to come into the gym knowing that there was no like like goal in my near sights, right? To, to know that there was no competition coming up and to know that really I was just seeing myself deteriorate over time. Yeah. It was just very much like, I don't want to go to the gym anymore. It, yeah. I, it got to October, December time. And I was like, I don't want to be here. Totally. Like I just, hit, I, I hit this snatch again. I hit seven. I hit, I hit another 70 kilo snatch. Okay. What now? You know, like right. I'm like, I'm not, I don't feel good. I don't feel like I'm, I'm moving in any way. And I'm an athlete. I need that competition attitude. You know, I need to be on that platform and I need to, I need to feel like I'm, I'm training towards a better version of myself. You know? Yeah. Um, I think that things like mental training and, and, you know, like, like fortitude training are important, but when it comes to transition, it's just, you got to find new ways to, to make yourself feel better. Cause ultimately it's just loss after loss for the beginning of transition. Yeah, especially as an athlete. Right, right. I, 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 I've never been able to talk to anybody who has been in a strength sport or in a sport where they have to, where maybe having that, you know, the, the, the testosterone that they used to have would be a benefit, right? So this is always interesting to me because I, I feel like I would struggle if I was in that spot too, because then you see it going down. So right now you have to, it's a WADA, right? The WADA protocol is like that you have mm -hmm. to, or the IOC, um, that you have to be, on hormones for two years before you can compete again in weightlifting. Can you tell me a little bit about, I'm not a hundred percent sure about all that. Yeah. So essentially what the IOC decided in 2004 is that regardless of any like further results, um, basically every trans woman should take a year and a half to two years off, um, to let their body go through the changes and to reduce the chance of any advantage that, that could be lingering from their, from their previous form. Right. Um, this is especially important in older athletes, right. Who are, who, you know, have gotten a bit into their lives and have cemented some testosterone effects in their bodies. Right. So people in their, um, late thirties, forties who, who want to start transitioning, um, this is especially important for them. So the estrogen can truly take effect. Right. right. Um, in younger bodies, it actually happens a little faster. So I'd say within a year, you start, you start to really get to those cisgender levels of strength. Um, uh, so like what they basically figured out was, okay, to make it the most fair that we can, take these two years off. Yeah. And you know, like as a trans, as a trans athlete, I needed those, I needed those two years off, you know, like I definitely felt like I needed that time to learn my body again and really figure out what's different. And like so much is different. Right. And yeah. like I move different. I feel things different. I see things different, you know, That's everything's crazy. changed. Um, so like, I don't think that it's unfair at all to, to be, you know, on this short little break. I think that there should be a pathway for trans athletes to compete in this little break because that's important that we can, that we keep competing. But after that little break, like hormones have taken effect. And I, I think especially now, like 
it's really clear that the hormones have taken effect. It's it's very clear day in day out that every time I go into the gym, I have to work a little bit harder to reach the same the same level of of strength that some of my peers have, yeah. pound for pound. What would you say to people who say because that's always the argument, right? Like, well, they've had X amount of years of testosterone. They've had you know all these years to build uh, strength, and two years is not enough. Um, what do you, what do you tell to people that, that tell you these kind of things? Um, well, I'd say that you don't know how hormones work in a trans body. <laughs> I mean, like straight up, right. Everybody, we've been basing sports around like testosterone as the criteria for, for a hundred plus years, right. We've been, we've been so focused on enhancing testosterone that for some reason we've stopped looking at the skill and talent of the athlete and stopped looking at athletes as individual cases instead of just a blanket case, right? right. Um, so especially for younger trans athletes, you hit that two-year mark and you have things like bone density decreasing. Um, my hands and feet have, have had some shrinkage because of the tendons and ligaments that are, that are moving around and shrinking huh. in here. Um, so like it's, we don't hold on to things. Like I took a week off um, at the very end of the year of 2021 because of COVID and I came back and it was like, oh my God, my body just wanted to get get rid of it all. Like wow. it was just um, basically how I explained it is that like, like if you, so, so your body, a cisgender body, right? Um, when you go to train, your body isn't, or isn't base isn't telling you, okay, we want to stop testosterone production or we want to in, increase testosterone production, right? You have the ability to kind of fluctuate back and forth on like producing excess testosterone and producing more muscle, right? And then producing ex excess estrogen, right? Basically for our bodies, for a trans body, we're taking these hormones that are actively telling us, okay, we don't want to build muscle. We're taking mm. these, these, these blockers too that are actively telling us like we don't want to hold on to these things. We don't want to hold on to strength. Um, I mean, I had been training my deadlift for a year now and I put on maybe 20, 20, 25 pounds, maybe. Um, I'm hoping I, I get that number up a little bit more, but like, I firmly believe that if I had been training, like I was with excess testosterone on my system, I would probably be pulling like five fifty six by now. Yeah. Um, especially with how hard I've been training, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So to anybody that says that two years isn't enough, I mean, like I'm I'm gonna hit two years this year, and I can already feel in my bones that like, whew, this this is a lot of work that I need to put in, right? right. Um, essentially, what we're finding is that like the more we just need to pack the volume in. If we're not constantly telling our bodies to adapt, and and as trans women, not constantly telling our bodies to put on that excess muscle and size that we need, mm -hmm. we're just gonna shed it off. And I, I and I see it like month to month. I can see like the the muscle shed off if if I'm not if I'm not consistent with it with my eating with my with my training everything. Wow, yeah, I never thought about that, right? Because if the if the hormones are really telling your body not to build, build, you have to do everything in your power to make it build, right? So you have to give it the right signals from your nutrition, your training, your recovery. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's always a, a discussion. I actually just had a discussion the other day um with one of my friends about you know that's one of my problems with it is that then we just look at testosterone too as if that is the mm -hmm. only marker you know and there's so many athletes now that especially haven't been able to compete in the olympics because you know they might be uh they might be mix of gender they might just have a little bit too much and then it becomes very weird mm -hmm. and it becomes this like well then where is where is too much you know like yeah what yeah. is the determining factor also you know like does that mean that they're not woman enough these kind of conversations come up mm -hmm. and i always think it's just so awful that we have to kind of stipulate these things um uh, but nobody can say for sure and i do feel that two years is more than enough um but i i you know it's one of those things that i wanted to ask because i, I do feel like it comes up all the time you know and it, it uh, it's one of those questions that i think is great to hear from you um but I did want to get into our little bit of a Q&A here. So we did have Absolutely. some questions on our Instagram. Um, and had, I, we had some great ones. So I'm going to kind of like sift through these. I love this one. And this one's from um, Sydney Ann. It's Sid.nay.ann. Some of these names, I'm going to tell you right now, they crack me up. Every time I have to say them on here, <laughs> I'm like, some of them, I'm like, oh, it's so clever. Mine's not very clever. You know, like, I'm like I just don't have Yours is nice. Like, you, is Archangel like your own? Or is that Angel's just... 
the name, but I love Archangel. Like, you know, that's pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> Angels, Angel was actually my legal middle name. Um, so like when I started transitioning, I was like, oh shit, I can just switch. It'll be easy. Perfect. Um, and then switching, switching into sports, I was like, I've always come at sports. Like when I'm on the field or I'm in the gym, I'm a different person. Like, yeah. like, like th this person goes away and this new confident, strong athlete comes out and I'm a big believer that everybody should have their own moniker you know everybody yeah. should should really create that identity for themselves for their sport because everybody deserves to feel like a fucking hero you yeah. know everybody wants to feel like a superhero walking around and yep. to have somebody address me as Archangel not only affirms me in my gender identity but also affirms me as an athlete you know like totally. you know my name yeah. you know you know who I am yeah and we all do it like how many people we see especially you know if their handles like IG handles we're always like you know mm -hmm. like uh quad quad you know there's always quad ones in there and thighs like i always laugh when i get to see these i'm like they just all make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> or like or like like bama burr you know right. like 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 fucking like bama is such a cool name just by itself by and itself like, you know it, it gives her this reputation where she walks around and everybody's like that's that's bama, that's bama. and you know i'm over here like oh you mean stacy like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stacey's awesome. We're, it's funny. I got a picture of uh, when we were at the showdown. And I don't know. I think we got yelled at because we were hella loud. Like, we were on the side, like, laughing. And mm -hmm. um, they caught a picture. Strong Shots. What's her name from Strong Shots? She got a picture of us. Mm -hmm. And Bama looks all like, like, she looks like she's, like, thirsty a little bit. She's like, what's up? Like, give me the side angle. It was so <laughs> funny. And I'm looking at her showing her something. I was like, I think we got in trouble in that picture. It wasn't anything, like, special. <laughs> Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah, she's one of my favorite people. For she sure. is. Let's, let's get to that Q and A. Yeah, let's, let's get to Q and A. &A. <laughs> um, I love this question by Sydney Ann. What is the best way cishet people, and this is cis heterosexual people, that means the for people who don't know, cis is is, is both you either identify as male or female, so that's you know mm -hmm. I guess we would say everybody else. Uh, cishet people can support and prioritize inclusivity for LGBTQ plus lifters. What is the best way? I mean, way? like. Right off the bat, I mean, the, the first best way is just to mind your business, right? Like yes. if somebody is trying to get their training or somebody's trying to, you know, just go about their life and do their thing and do what they love the most, why does it bother you? You know, mm -hmm. like if, if, if I walk into a gym and you know who I am, you know that I'm a trans woman, why would it bother you unless there's like some outward bigotry going on? You know, like in most cases, and I think like in most, like in, in all cases, most people are just trying to walk around and mind their business and just get their shit done and get out. Totally. Right. Um, so the idea that like we should be protecting spaces from trans women, it's just like it's preposterous because like, you know, who's the most scared of those spaces? Trans women. Yeah. You know, it's like ranging from anything from bathrooms to the gym. It's like we don't want to be in those spaces because it's already unfriendly to us and right. you're scared of us. Yeah. You know, like what's what's going on besides that? Really, it's about like affirming those athletes next to you whether they're trans or cisgender you know like um the amount of people that come into liberation every single day that i get to affirm and i get to tell them hey you look great today or oh shit those are moving well today those little comments go so far to just like completely create the sense of compassion and affirmation within the gym that just fosters development for everybody right like right. The happier that we are as a community and the, the, the more that we lift each other up, the less that we're going to fall behind in our goals. Yeah. I, I, wonderful. I love that. That was a great answer. Um, can you tell me what is the day and life of transitioning for them? Uh, maybe right now for you. And this is from Got to Be Jordana. Gotcha. Uh, so day in the life. Um, as for my hormone regimen right now, I am on an estrogen pellet. So essentially, I have a couple little pellets that are implanted in me. The estrogen automatically tells my body to not produce excess testosterone and the body prefers to jump on that on that estrogen. Besides that, I also take a progesterone pill at night to help with any like developments such as breast tissue and then to further block any testosterone that might slip through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Um Besides that, really a lot of my day right now is running a, running from podcast interview, right? And then in my training, it's very much like volume, 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 right? Yeah. Like I'm going to get my big lifts done. And then after that, I'm going to see, okay, have I have I hit a little extra volume on my quads uh, quads this week? Have I hit some extra volume on my hamstrings this week? Where, where are my shoulders at, you know? And it's trying to figure out what do I need to stimulate so I can keep everything up to date with my body, right? Yeah. Um, Appetite wise, it's a struggle. Um, it, I firmly feel like my body is constantly trying to be like, you're like 175 pounds, you're a little tiny girl. 
And I'm like, no, bro, I'm like 210. Like, I need to eat. Um, so right now, the big struggle is My like, life. I mean, I sat down to eat. <laughs> I sat down to eat a couple tacos right now and I got stuck midway through. Like, I get nauseous mid meal, you know, because mm-hmm. like, my body will literally say like, you don't need to eat this. Like, why would you want to eat this? You're trying to, you're trying to lose weight. We don't want this. We don't want this excess mass. Interesting. Um, so really, and that's part of what the volume does it, is it stimulates that growth in me where I actually have an appetite. Right. I literally have to train my appetite into existence now. And it's very, very frustrating at times. Wow. Yeah. So that must be, do you, have you ever counted how much volume you have? Like pounds? How many, how often are you training a week? Um, I try and get in the gym at least once a day, like six days a week. Um, okay. so, so it'll range between five and six, um, three heavy lifting days and then three bodybuilding and uh, accessory days. Yeah. Um, those heavy lifting days, of course, putting squat, bench, deadlift. Um, and then the bodybuilding that I do is a lot of just like the more old school, um, not, not, not even old school, but like the, the kind of like the, the high rep, high volume, we're going to load the weight up and just keep moving it until we can't pull this shit anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's very much like I haven't directly been writing down the amount of volume that I've been hitting because like, we've just now realized that volume is the key. Um, but with this, with this next cycle coming up and with like, you know, some, some, some possible things like nationals coming up, I, I really am looking into like, getting a journal out and writing out like this is my exact volume for this day and tracking it all the way through. And it's going to be a really cool experience. Yeah. I was just thinking like this would be kind of a cool Mm -hmm. how to for people who are lifters Mm -hmm. and want, I mean, I think that we would all want that same thing, you know? So it's like, yeah, this has worked for me. This is the kind of uh, regimen, you know, that this kind of split work the best. I think that's, that's actually a great idea. I wouldn't be surprised. Like uh, I use a train heroic for our, um, our athletes um, at my gym and um, it counts the volume, right? Like at the end of Mm -hmm. each workout, it's like, you know, it can range anywhere from five to whatever. Yeah, It'd be kind of interesting to see what your, your loading volumes are like weekly, even leading up to a meet or, you know, where you had best, um, the best volume, you know, or Mm -hmm. results based off of that. Be really cool to kind of see that process. All right. Next one. Absolutely. Um, what advice would you give to trans kids about facing adversity? This is from D underscore mole 12. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, well, my biggest advice for trans kids would be to do do the thing, like do everything, do whatever you can be successful no matter what you do, because ultimately your success is going to outweigh whatever hate you get along the way and whatever adversity you get along the way, um, especially for our trans kids that can play sports um, throughout the country. Uh, House Bill 25 just passed in Texas. So unfortunately, um, there's a lot of trans kids that just lost, lost access to sports as as a primary mode of development and uh, and community. Um, But for those kids that can get in the sports world, and especially those kids that um, are going through the process of hormone blockers, that are going through the process of HRT with their parents, their doctors, their their lawyers sometimes, you know, these teams of people they they brought together. um, To those kids, get in the gym, go learn your body, go train your body, you know, Um, get on get on the stage, you know, get in class, get get in front of a canvas, do what you love doing, because ultimately, what's going to affirm you the most is doing what you love and what you're going to feel the most at home doing is what you love. You know, and I think that if you're going to live your true self, you should live your true self throughout everything you do. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, uh, and this is also from D underscore mole 12. What makes you smile on a daily? It's the community of liberation. Honestly, it's, it's the fact that I, I walk in and it's instantly like smiles. Everybody's super happy. I've been to a lot of gyms where people kind of just keep to themselves. They don't converse. They don't really like build that community aspect. Um, But to have a very close knit community like Liberation, it's just, it's game changing, you know, like to walk in at at 6 p.m. on a on a late training day and have people there that are just having the time of their lives doing what they love the most, you know, Um, to have other athletes there that are that are pushing each other like so hard, pushing each other to the limits of what they can do. Yeah. And then to have general fitness people there that don't exactly understand why we're killing ourselves every day, yeah. but still are there like amazed, yeah. cheering us on, pushing us. Like that kind of community is very rare and yeah. nothing makes me smile like seeing seeing those friendly faces every time I walk in. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that it, I was just talking about how the, rare that is, you know, especially 
Mm -hmm. uh, building a community, it can't be like structured. It just happens, but it happens because of the people, right? So it's people like you, Vinny, everybody there. Those are the people that create an environment um, that's like that. And that's wonderful to, to hear. All right. Absolutely. Um, so th these two I thought was cool. What gave you the courage to start training? I'm still terrified. And this is from Dorothy underscore Delon Prix. Gotcha. I, and I think I think prior she had said something uh, something else prior. But what gave you the courage to start training? I think before transition, it was my dad. My dad was always the one that was pushing me like my dad knew from I mean, he had me when he was 20. My mom was 19. So they really had no clue what they were doing my entire childhood. <laughs> Um, so they were kind of just winging it, you yeah. know, and, and, and like good, good on them for trying to find the best ways to keep me out of trouble and like really develop me as a, as a person as well. Right. Um, so like he was the one that was pushing me to do every sport. He was the one that was pushing me, Hey, there's a personal trainer down the street. Let's get you in with him. He was the one pushing me in high school. Like you're a talented athlete. Let's get you training and let's get you going, you know? Um, after transition, especially in this in the in that year's time where me and my dad kind of like took our so took a little bit of time away from each other, it it was me, I think, that gave me the courage, right? It was knowing that this is what I love doing the most, right? And this is what this is what makes me feel the most fulfilled. Um and that's why I, I make it a I make it a point to tell every single athlete that asks me for coaching or every single athlete that simply talks to me like you don't have to do what I do. You don't have to train like like we do. You don't have to be a, 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 a like an elite powerlifter, an elite weightlifter, an elite bodybuilder, or a CrossFit athlete. You know, you can do yoga. You can do like kettlebell tricks. You can do just barbell tricks. You know, and just find you find your niche and find where you truly enjoy yourself. Um, and once you find that place where you enjoy yourself in your training, that's when the real results the results start to coming. And that's where the consistency comes from. You know, we can't. You know. As athletes, we push ourselves to, to places we don't want to be all the time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's also important that we enjoy ourselves and we smile and we have some fun in our training. And that's what's going to keep us coming back every day. Yeah, I think it does. It takes us, It takes something you have to be interested in. And it takes those mm -hmm. baby steps. Like I always joke and tell people, like I started off uh, training in college. My degree was in kinesiology. But then I took a break off when I came back. I started off with Zumba. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I like dancing, me and my girl, you know, we were dancing and I had no idea what Zumba was back then. And that was the first step. It was Zumba and then Zumba for a little bit. And then I was like, you know what? I think I can go back to the weight room. And then I got courage to kind of do that. And then I was like, I can go back to a bigger gym. I was training yeah. at my, you know, like apartment cause I didn't want to see anybody. I was, I was definitely that person who was unconfident. Um, but it does take just that. You got to find something you dig and it might lead you to strength training. It might not, but you're able to mm -hmm. kind of get yourself back into some sort of fitness and that's always better than nothing. Yeah. It's all step by step. Like, like yeah. and, and that's the most important thing. Take things step by step. You don't have to be the, the most amazing person in the gym like day one, but Hey, you might get to day 90 and be like, I want to beat everybody else. I want to be the best. I want to be absolutely amazing. Yeah, right. Totally, totally. Um, and everybody should feel that. Yeah, I agree. You know, that's the athlete in you and that's the athlete in me. Mm -hmm. Like I played absolutely. basketball and after, after I tore my ACL, I was like, now what? You know, like, and yeah, then, and it, it's like the one thing that everybody goes to, right? It's powerlifting because mm -hmm. there's not like, you know, I ain't got to go like laterally move and I don't have to do all this other stuff. Um, all right. Um, what was your first step you took in learning to love and accept yourself more and feel more comfortable in your skin? I would say maybe after transitioning. And this is from uh, Fit with Ashley. The first step was like stepping out the door, honestly, like mm. to, like the literal first step, you know, um, it was I was taking things very slowly. I was slowly experimenting, you know, OK, I'm going to start wearing a sports bra every day. I'm going to start wearing this every day. I'm going to start talking like this a little bit. I'm going to add this word into my vocabulary. I'm going to wear my hair like this. Right. Um, and honestly, the most important step in that beginning process was finding a safe space. Right. Um, my girlfriend created an amazing safe space for me at home where I was able to experiment and figure out what I liked and didn't like, and was able to figure out, you know, who angel really was. And then at liberation to be able to have a safe space where I can find out what kind of athlete is angel, you know, like, who is Angel in the gym? Who is Angel underneath the barbell? Is she the same as, as she used to be or is, is she different? And ultimately, she is different, you know? Yeah. Um, and ultimately, it's putting yourself 
you have to put yourself in a position to learn more about yourself if you really want to live your true self. You know, you have to challenge yourself. Um, and it wasn't until I challenged myself and I pushed myself to experiment and and really try and learn what felt the best and what made me feel happy and euphoric throughout my day. Like euphoria is is something that for some reason we just lose and we should be trying our best to feel amazing every single day. And like for some reason we kind of lost that. Yeah, and it sounds like it's not one big like boom moment, right? It sounds like mm-hmm. there's these little things that almost like training, right? It's all the small little things that we're going to do, right? And so it sounds like you had to take those little steps. I heard a, I think it was your cameo interview and you had said something about a Halloween outfit. Um, yeah. And that somebody, could could you tell that story? Because I, I didn't get to hear all of it, but I loved what I did get to hear. Yeah, it was um, Halloween 2019. I had just come out to my close circle as trans. Um, and really it was my very first time ever dressing up as anything. So I went and like I bought this like cute little skirt. I bought this cute little top. I got fishnets. I got these like really cute angel wings. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna say fuck it and do it. And you know what? It's just gonna, it's 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 gonna be fine. I'm just gonna figure it out, right? And I think I said in the in the, in the cameo interview that um, that I walked outside and I was walking with a group of of my girlfriends at the time. And this car of girls just slowly drove down the street and just yelled out like you look so amazing. Oh my God. Um, and like, it might not have been at me. Right. But like to have that experience of like, Oh my God, somebody's affirming me and and, and what I'm wearing and somebody thinks that I look amazing. That was, that was huge. You know, that was huge to, for my confidence going into that night and honestly for the rest of my life. Yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. Okay. So this is the part of the show where I ask my guests, what the fuck was I thinking? Where you look back at a time Probably, and you're probably going to have a lot of this because you've been an athlete a long time in your training, in your competing, where you look back and now you think, what the fuck was I doing, doing that? Or why the fuck did I do that? That was really dumb. Is there anything that you can think of? Oh, my big problem with training is that I got mad ADHD. Like I, (laughs) I'm constantly, I'm overthinking everything at all times. I can never stop moving. I'm always like, I'm always doing a million things at once, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And see, with powerlifting, I can get away with it. But when I'm training Olympic lifting, everything's got to be the exact same all the time, right? Um, So the problem was that I would get frustrated, especially in the beginning of transition. I would get frustrated with how the weight would feel. Um, I'd get angry that I was losing so much strength. Um, So I'd come in and I'd just start changing technique. I'd start changing things that don't need to be changed. And I'd start overthinking these these processes that I've spent two years prior, like building up and and, and learning and and cementing. And really it was, it was like December, 2020 that I, that I sat back and I was like, why am I changing everything that I'm doing? What am I doing? What am I thinking? Like, I, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. And I know I'm good at this. Like I may not be the strongest person in the world, but I know that I have some skill here and I shouldn't be changing things just because I feel like shit, you know? Yeah, totally. It's because you didn't want to drop the weight, right? Because you probably could have kept Absolutely. the technique. You could have kept all the things, but the meathead in us are like, well, I'm not fucking dropping that weight anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was the big struggle, right? Is that meathead inside of me that was like, you're getting weak. You're getting so weak. What's going on? And like the other side of me that was like, no, it's okay. This is a natural process of what's supposed to happen. But like, you know, you yeah. know, athletes, like yeah. we, we, we start, we start feeling like, like we're losing things and it's just a massive freak out. And totally. You know, like I I tell everybody that if your mental game isn't there, like you're not going to succeed as as an athlete. Um, And I think that's one of the big challenges of being a trans athlete is is the mental game. And it really is like you're at competitions and you're not worried about how you can move. You're worried about how you feel and you're worried about how other people feel about you. Um, And it's a lot of stress on the mind and it's it's a lot of pressure. Um, But I take faith in my own training and my own skill and my own talent. And I know that regardless of my hormone profile or regardless of how my body's built, that nothing is going to get me to the top except that technique and, and except being good and being talented and wanting it more, you know, like if you're an athlete, you just got to want it. And if you want it, you're going to get it, you know, you just got to want it more than the other person. And and that's it. And that, that should be, that, that should be it, you know? Yeah, I agree. All right. Before I let you go, There is, I would like to see if there's any advice you have for any lifters who are 
either transitioning or thinking about transitioning, you know, is there any advice that you would give to them um, knowing what you've had to go through in this past two years? Shoot for success. Like, like, like I said earlier, it's, it's shoot for success. It's being, it's be the best that you could possibly be. Um, what we do is hard and what we do is a struggle. And I, I feel like not a lot of people get to see that, that what the training that we put ourselves through is so difficult. Yeah. Um, for trans athletes specifically, I'd say surround yourself with a good circle and really make a name for yourself. You know, give yourself that moniker, give yourself that space to, to be known as someone, give yourself that space to become something that you're not and to chase excellence. You know, um, you're only going to reinforce your transition by chasing excellence. And you're, you're by, by transitioning, you're already seeking to be a better version of yourself. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, so hit the gym every day, knowing that you're once again, seeking to be a better version of yourself day in, day out. Beautiful. Miss Archangel, this has been <laughs> fabulous. And I am so excited for people to hear your story and hear how that tied in with powerlifting. I had so many questions. I was like, they were talking about your transition and everything. And I'm like, but what about this in training? What about this in training? Because there were all these things that I was like, oh, I'm excited to get I get to ask her. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for being on the show. No, absolutely. It, it was, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to give you all my contact information. Cool. If you want to have me back at any given point in time, just let me know. I am completely open to you. I want to make myself available to you. Wonderful. Um, so just let me know if you need anything. All right.